one more minute. I'm going to get started around 8.03. Uh, unfortunately, Chris Seifel had an obligation come up. So sadly, we won't be hearing from him. But if there's another uh, expert in the crowd on the gaming sector, maybe, Zay, do you want to speak for a little bit? Maybe we'll bring you up um, to chat. It's fine. Um, okay. All right. 8.02. I like to usually go into 8.03 is really... Uh, I find that the three minute rule is the best. We're around 20, oh, around 45. I usually start around 50. So let's, uh, if some of my listeners maybe could share out this space, um, just tag me or whatever. We're going to get started. I like to get to 50. We're right there. Um, and then we're going to lead things off to my speakers tonight. Uh, you're going to have plenty of time to chat. We are going to run for about an hour. You're all going to have time to chat about gaming, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to talk. It won't be as. Uh, 500. I really, like I said before, Portnoy. He's a real good guy. Um, I think that he's he's one of the best marketers for their brand. Uh, DraftKings. So this is something that I uh, I currently own right now too. And they're the reason why I think that DraftKings is going to be the number one bet here in the sports betting sector is is due to them really being that clear market leader. Uh, it's not even a question about who is making better moves out there. It seems like every other day I have a new notification that they just became like the premier sports betting partner or maybe fantasy football partner with the NFL, uh, which was an incredible deal. And the stock is still down, which is pretty crazy to me. Um, then you, and then I actually just made a YouTube video about this too, is Fubo. So gosh, uh, man, there's so much to talk about. I can just do a total data dump with you guys, but um, Wolf, was there any sort of like questions that people had that no, we so, should be touching on? So I think that what we were going to, most of our speakers are going to touch on is they're going to touch on specific stocks. So maybe just yeah. some of the leaders in the gaming industry, maybe just give some of your opinions on them. No need to go too broad. I know um, Gannon's going to touch on the nerd ETF. Justin's going to touch on skills. Um, just, you know, some specific stocks in this area, what attracts you to them, what the potential is for them in this industry. Yep. Well, I own skills, Fubo, and DraftKings at the moment right now. And I think that there's another one that I should need to give an honorable mention about is, is Rust Street Interactive. They're a multi-international company. Uh, so they are located down in South America, which readdresses their TAM. Uh, it's very hard to really get an understanding of exactly where the sports betting industry is going uh, due to the legalization efforts here in the United States. So that's that's uh, it's one of the underdogs out there. So RSI is going to be a good one. DraftKings, like I mentioned before, is a clear market reader. Uh, Penn National, it's, it's integrated within its casinos. So it's not like that true mobile iGaming platform. It's because that's going to be Barstool Sports, right? So Barstool is the subdivision of their of their uh, betting, and then uh, Fubo. I think I think it's going to be this is going to be one of the ones that a lot of people have been down on, uh, much like skills. And I know that Justin, I, I think he, I think we bounce ideas off and back and forth with each other. But Fubo is going to be one of the more interesting ones where it's actually getting into sports betting, and they uh, created a sports betting division, um, and they're a sports streaming first. Uh, so this one is is the most I think where it stands here today, I think that if you were to say that there's one company that has the, the best ability to become a multi-bagger opportunity, I would say it's going to be Fubo. So that's that's where I'm seeing it at the moment. Cool. Cool. I appreciate that insight. I know that some of our other speakers have thoughts on Fubo. Um, I'm just going to keep running around this because we have plenty of time to chat tonight. So Caleb, uh, I'm going to go to you next just for your thoughts. So just props to Caleb. He's the reason that this space is actually happening. Uh, he reached out to me with wanting to make something happen on the gaming industry. And now here we are chatting. So Caleb, just your thoughts on if any specific stocks stick out to you and maybe uh, why. Sure. So do we want to kind of start like this and then come back to us for kind of what we wanted to talk about? Uh, I, I'm just going to give you leeway, to be honest, um, on either area. Uh, you can start off with specific stocks. You start off with the overview. Um Mostly kind of game industry. Uh, feel free to you know lead the conversation as you'd like there because it was your uh, idea. Oh, all right. Well, okay. So I guess maybe I'll just kind of go the way that I was gonna go. So this this might be a little long to get started here. Uh, we'll, we'll go for like five minutes and just kind of see how we're at. So uh, the reason I had mentioned this to Wolf is because I feel like the gaming sector has has been going gangbusters for the last multiple decades, right? I mean, I'm 35. Uh, I grew up on the Nintendo. Uh, let's see, that would have been mid-90s. Uh, my favorite games were Punch-Out and Super Contra. 
And then I got the Sony PlayStation for Christmas, maybe when I was uh, maybe 97, 98, I suppose, because I remember playing Madden and Game Day. Uh, and I really never got into much PC gaming. Uh, a little bit when the, around the, the Sims games. Uh, I did play Sim City and Sim Farm on, on, I believe those were Super Nintendo, and those were just like mind blowing when I was like seven and eight years old. <clears throat> and then I did play the Sims on PC in, in junior high. And I think as it got into the 90s, when the internet took off, is when we could kind of interact with each other. Whether at that time you couldn't, you couldn't uh, communicate be between the platforms like you can today. So, you know, I would use like MSN, AOL, that type of thing. Uh, but but after those those years, as I started in my late teens, I kind of fell away from gaming. Uh, I really haven't been much into gaming since my early teen years I just talked about. Uh, but as I started to kind of get in my, my professional life, I really started to realize how much gaming was a universe of its own. Uh, in 2014, I, I had a kind of a, a life-changing event and I had to uh, live with some new people. And so one of my roommates, he worked in ad tech uh, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about where he worked or nothing like that, but one, EA sports was actually one of his biggest clients at that time. And what his work was pretty much was uh, online shopping carts and, and setting up and working with uh, the sellers of the content to make sure that the whole, end user experience was smooth. And uh, if you were trying to buy things th that worked. And so I kind of learned a little bit from him about that at that time. And I have referenced him a few times in the last couple, in the last year or so about ad tech. Uh, I haven't got to see him much lately. And I, I really want to pick his brains on a lot of stuff. Outside of that type of gaming, I currently do uh, fantasy football online. I have mostly we do it via ESPN or Yahoo and I, I do it all via mobile. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit more about mobile in a little bit because that's where I really think things are headed. Uh, I do almost all my social media on mobile, including Twit, uh, FinTwit. I don't really use my computer a whole lot. Just it's easy and it's, it's in your hands. And, and that's kind of where I'm going to be going with this presentation. Uh, I love fantasy football. I, I do quite well in it. I'm good with data and analytics, and so a lot of that stuff just makes sense. I don't really even need to know that much about the players. Uh, two of my close friends are extreme fantasy sports bettors. They use DraftKings primarily. Uh, if there's a way to gamble on sports, they're going to do it. Uh, they love golf, basketball, baseball. I mean, one of the guys is the ad tech guy I told you about, and it's just amazing how much you can do with online gambling I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to keep calling it gambling, you know, online sports betting. Uh, what I, I'm, I'm trying to frame this up in a, in a way people do it positively and for fun, not, not gambling. I, I don't like to use that word. Don't get me wrong. Uh, before I start talking about the companies, like I mentioned uh, yesterday, I was kind of tweeting out some of my ideas while the presenters were going. I pretty much, I always think about companies uh, like the underbelly, uh, like the framework, you know, what props it up, what makes it possible. You know, if you're going to have stuff online, you have to have cybersecurity, you know, you have to have uh, a way to make it happen, you know, uh, cybersecurity, internet of things, you know, all those types of companies. And I feel like, yeah, the, yeah, the pandemic pulled some of these companies forward, yada, yada, yada. But with the trajectory of what people are using to get things done and, 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 and how much relevance there is. I like to think about, you know, what makes these things possible, what props it up. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into any of that side, but that's kind of where I try to think, you know, so let's say, for example, uh, TikTok was using Fastly, you know, and then that whole drama and then who these other <clears throat> companies are using, you know, maybe they're going with companies that are really well known to be safe. Well, I, I like to take a little bit more risk on my investments. And so that's where we're going to get here now. Um, so I had started to take note of, of how much time people were spending playing games uh, on their phones, you know, mobile, mobile gaming and the addiction. Uh, because if when you have mobile, as long as you have a connection to the Internet, you can play anywhere at any time. And I really think that as 5G continues to roll out and people have phones with those technologies, 
I think that this is just going to start, it's going to really start taking off because there's going to be a lot faster connections. You're going to be able to do a lot more. Phones are just going to keep on advancing. You know, I like to just sit around and think about like, what are, what's it going to look like and what, what's it going to be next? And I just think that with how much 5G is going to speed things up, anything that is on mobile is it could see some some massive, massive growth in the, in these next few years. Uh, so this is kind of where I come in with my mobile investing now. I've talked about digital turbines before at APPS. Uh, that's not gaming, but that's that's mobile, what, what I'm going to keep on referencing to. Uh, and then also skills, uh, ticker SKLZ, uh, just because that's basically set up to do all the gaming, for, again, from mobile. Um, my angle has been ad tech, uh, coupled with you know advertising via mobile, where I've tried to learn a lot more about how mobile gaming and advertising might be a really, really good investment going forward. Um, I've really recently become enthralled with augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, and when I, I first tried Facebook Oculus in 2016, and I was just completely blown away. If you have not tried video re virtual reality yet, you can go to Best Buy and try out Oculus. You, you just have to do it. Uh, Later, I watched a few episodes of a, a show called Black Mirror, and that just completely set my thinking that augmented reality is, is going to be the big thing going forward. Uh, and, and why I'm saying this is because gaming is going to be tied into it as well, right? You know, whether you put on the, the devices and like you're going to be doing boxing or football or whatever, I mean, this stuff's coming and it's going to be really, truly amazing. And so I feel that unless something goes horribly wrong, with these concepts and development, I think this is going to really be the big sector in the coming years. Uh, I know some of these companies have been getting just absolutely drilled. Uh, and it's not even just the, you know, the, the user type apps, it's things that are connected to them as well. Uh, and I think that anything you can, any type of device or company, you can get global adoption at a fair price. It's going to have exponential growth tied to it. And that's again, lo and behold, Facebook, they already have over two and a half billion users. They own Oculus. I think that this is just another amazing forward thinking by Zuck and his staff. So the four companies that I wanted to talk about were Enthusiast Gaming, ticker ENGMF, Unity Software, ticker U, Skills Gaming, SKLZ, and Gravity Software, GRVY. So it's been about seven minutes. Do you want me to just keep rolling? Yeah. Oh, so first off, Twitter investors, I can hear Mike. Hot Mike. Cool. Uh, yeah, Caleb, uh, how about maybe give us like another four? Um, yep. I, I feel like I'm, I'm learning plenty. I'm enjoying. I'm listening. Uh, our other speakers are going to have plenty of time to talk as well. Uh, so so no worries on my end. I know spaces be a little weird. Some people are getting cut out. Uh, I saw just Dylan was out for a second. Now he's back. But yeah, maybe just, you know, give us another four. Um, enjoy hearing. I'm enjoying hearing your thoughts, dude. I always do. Cool. So of the four I mentioned, uh, I did sell my shares in skills this morning. It was a pretty small position, uh, but I had to get out of that just because I, I'm not going to take a huge, enormous loss that's going to screw me for the whole the whole year. I had said I still think long term it's got great growth potential. But the one of these four that I'm most excited about is uh, Enthusiast Gaming. Uh, I actually bought shares in this on March 23rd, right after their last earnings. Uh, they have very, very much so hyper growth. It's it's pretty inc pretty incredible, really. The last quarter was 360% uh, growth, uh, revenue growth uh, compared to last year, of course. Uh, they engage in media events and esports worldwide. Um, it's a digital platform that has over 100 gaming related websites and, and 900 YouTube channels. They have over 24 million YouTube subscribers. Uh, the, one of the one of the main ones that maybe people are familiar with is Luminosity Gaming. It's a leading global esports franchise uh, known for its competition competitors in games such as Call of Duty and Fortnite. I think probably everybody in this call knows what Call of Duty and Fortnite is. So um, their last earnings, which was uh, very recent, they, had, <clears throat> they, they announced they had closed, closed new deals with Activision, Disney, and Amazon. They grew their subscriber base by 60%. And they're combining their interests and content with Samsung TV Plus, TikTok, TikTok, and Snapchat. Those are some great uh, companies to be working with. Uh, on their on their website, they actually have a really good flywheel that 
talks about these things in a really, really quick uh, manner. If, if you want to look at that type of thing, um, their average user spends 15 hours a week gaming. That's, that's, that's quite significant. Uh, they have over 10 billion quarterly views. This is a really, really small company with really small companies. There's a lot of risk. This is traded on, this is a Canadian company. It's traded, uh, over the counter. So if, if you are looking to buy shares in this, make sure you look to see if there's fees with it, because these can be really expensive if you are buying on a on a broker that doesn't, uh, that, that charges fees for that type of thing. So be careful. Um, so that that's what I'm, what I'm most bullish about. Unity Software is, is one of the other ones I'm really interested in. Uh, one of my close friends is a really high up software engineer. And a few years ago, he actually created a few games using Unity software and their tutorials. Uh, he told me that he chose Unity because it had the lowest barrier to entry. And he said that he thinks other game engines have had to play catch up because of that. Uh, he had talked about Unreal Engine, which is owned by Epic Games, which at the time was much more powerful, but it was harder for him to, to, to develop on his own. He thought that Unity was less powerful, but it was easy for cross-platform development. And he said that Unity had tons of great tutorials for learning and using. Uh, I, I'm not going to go in much else. You guys can look that up. That's been a pretty pretty popular company for quite a while now. Um, skills, just want to touch on. Yeah, I sold my shares today. I took like a, I think it was like a 40 or 50% total loss. It was a small position, but, you know, who knows where it's going to go, but right now I, I want to be focused on my core positions. Uh, they're growing gangbusters. You know, they've been delivering, you know, I, I would say long-term, I'm sure it's going to be fine. Most of the companies I sold in 2020, I ended up buying shares back higher. Um, you just kind of take, take that with a grain of salt. And the last company, uh, I've been following Gravity, ticker GRVY, for about a year and a half. It's a, it's a company based in Korea. Um, they have a few branches around the world, and they're most they're most known for Ragnarok Online, which has been a massively successful game. This is a company where a lot of their revenue is tied to a few big winners, so this is extremely volatile. Um, if you look up their their quarterly earnings, you're going to see it right there. Um, this has come back big time the last year from where it was at its high. Uh, but yeah, those are the four companies I'm most interested in: uh, Enthusiast Gaming. Unity, skills, and gravity. So that's kind of what I had. Cool. Love that overview. Uh, I'm pretty big on ENGMF as well. That is the Enthusiast Gaming. Uh, looked into the company, honestly, a good amount. Menasha Kestenbaum, their CEO. I've DM'd with him a little bit on LinkedIn, actually. Uh, I'm currently up 56.5% on the company. Um, it's not a massive position, but it's, it's nice. It's one of the bigger positions in my Roth. I actually am holding that, but I will say massive risk with a company that's of that yep. size. I will say. Yeah. I was pretty impressed with their, um, their C-suite and their board. Quite a few of them have major backgrounds in gaming and uh, online. So that I always like that when I see that they, they, they're basically, that's their roots and they know what they're doing. And it's not just, you know, let's hire the, the best seller that there is. So that was one thing I took into consideration. Great job on that one. Yeah. Yeah. That was one where I, I mean, I saw that coming up from like a dollar and there was so much insight excitement around it. And then they made these fantastic acquisitions. I just loved it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Caleb, for that overview. Um, we're going to move on to a couple of others. Uh, I find it fascinating that you talked about selling your skill shares today. I can't, you know what? Uh, I, I have to go right to Justin. Because there, there has to be. A, I want to hear the riff back, <laughs> Justin. Give me all the heat. Give me all the fire. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot to talk about with skills. It's definitely been an interesting like five weeks or so. Uh, just how since everyone's kind of uh, given a background uh, about their gaming and their uh, how it's kind of been in their lives. I, I grew up a gamer. Um, I've always I've never been a, a PC gamer. I've always been a console gamer. I grew up. Uh, I can hear, I hear you, Caleb. I'm, I'm 32, so we're in a similar age bracket. I grew up in the age of, you know, the Nintendo 64, uh, Legend of Zelda. I played Pokemon on, you know, the Game Boy Color, all that good stuff. So, uh, and I actually, even today, um, I actually own an Xbox Series X. Um, you know, after we put our kids to bed, my wife likes to lay in bed and read, and I'll lay in bed and and do a little bit of gaming, uh, kind of just to shut down the brain a little bit, unwind for a little bit. So that's kind of a nice way to relax for me. But um, yeah, skills has had a lot going on uh, the last, you know, month or so. 
Um, I just so everyone knows, I, I'm long skills. It's a it's something that I consider a significant position in my portfolio. Um, my cost basis is in the 19s, so I've I've ridden it up to the 46 it hit in February, and then back down again. Um, it's been a little bit of a of a wild ride to say the least, um, and it's it's kind of a it's kind of you know hard for me to choose where to start with it because you know there's kind of two schools of thought and um you know whenever you have a stock that's just taken the beating that skills has it brings out a lot of emotions and a lot of people um i have you know friends and family that are um you know some people have i know personally who own skills are have been freaking out i know people who i talk with online that i don't know personally but i you know we we talk online through twitter and other social media so i, I feel like i know them and and those people are a lot of people are nervous about what's happened and you know the only thing i can say is it's hard to connect the dots with short term price action um stocks go up and down for a lot of reasons um in, re- in regards to skills i i don't i try not to pay attention to all the the tides of sentiment. I know that there's some um, heavy short interest on skills right now. It's been kind of uh, beaten up a lot with some of the other SPAC link names. Um, I know there was another short report that came out today and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give the shorts too much of a, of a spotlight. I just, it's just funny to me how these short reports are always, um, anonymous accounts that were just recently created you know there's a lot of scary language a lot of scary i I think the one today was trying to compare um skills to luck in coffee um and it's just a lot of scary language that people try to use to um you know stir up the emotions and investors and i think it's important to um just take everything you hear with a grain of salt and you know i'm a bull on skills but you know i i'm not you know, you got to look at things with as unbiased a, a, a viewpoint as possible. Um, you know, if the company, uh, it's a new company, They're, they've only had one quarter under their belt as a public stock. You know, if they can't execute moving forward, if the NFL deal is a flop, you know, of course, you know, even if you're long now, you got to reconsider your thesis. But to see the price action and all this you know, trolling and negative negativity. It's just been frustrating from my point to see online. It's because really nothing fundamentally with skills has changed. So, um, you know, if, if people sell, you know, I, you know, everyone's got to manage their own position. You know, there's no, there's nothing personal. There's no, there's no, I, I don't like to see all the animosity that shows up when people start arguing about a position, but from my viewpoint with skills, the long-term thesis is still intact. Um, Caleb did a great job uh, talking about, uh, you know, the mobile power of gaming. And I, I just loved his point about 5G. I think the, the the increasing connectivity of, you know, where we are, it's like 10 years, a little over 10 years ago, I think 2007 is when the uh, iPhone, the smartphone really became a thing. And, you know, that was kind of like that breakthrough moment for technology where, you know, people are just introduced to this new device that can just change the world we live in. And now you're seeing, um, you know, years later, just how much room uh, this technology has to roam. You know, we got better connectivity. People are now doing everything from paying their bills to talking to loved ones. They're meeting people online. It's really like the phone has replaced the computer for a lot of people. And, I just think there's so much potential in that. Dylan, I know you and I have tweeted back and forth about skills a few times. Um, I think skills is a really, is in a really good position. Um, it's not a perfect comparison, but you know, for people that don't know, it's almost like the Shopify of mobile gaming skills is a software platform that allows game developers to monetize, uh, their their gaming product by enabling competitive gaming on on the skills platform people will um, pay to play a game there will be a pot between the two player fees and then the winner gets you know the majority of, of the winnings with skills and the game developer taking a cut out of that so um it's it's a very cool way for game developers to monetize their product because Really what's happened over time uh, with the iOS store and and to a point on Google Play, which Skills is um, only slightly exposed to right now. But 
it's so hard for games to be discovered. You know, you have like your mega developers that kind of have the big titles and for the, you know, th- hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, game developers and, and software engineers out there that want to, you know, have a dream of building their own product. It's really hard to kind of um, be able to bring a product to market because the costs of enabling fair play and, and having a skill based matching system, all this infrastructure related stuff that really only the, the deep pocketed developers can afford to provide. Um, they don't really have an outlet for that. So that's where skills comes in. And I think skills is going to over time. And, and Wolf, you can stop me whenever I'm kind of just rambling. <laughs> there was so much going yeah, on with skills lately. I, I'm just kind of rambling. I didn't really have anything. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head right now. That's what but, I, uh, that's what I wanted to hear, man. <laughs> so Justin, yeah, <clears throat> go ahead. Is it, is it okay if I build on top of that just a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's do what cool. let's do just a minute or two, and then let's give uh, Gannon a chance to speak. Perfect. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll make it short and sweet here. Uh, it's important to know, guys, that skills are it, it got ahead of itself. So I understand that it's the price action has been obviously very bearish lately, but we have to just put on a, a like our you know just a couple different metrics that are out there right now. It closed at a market cap of five point five billion dollars. So it's currently guiding for $336 million in 2021, by the end of 2021, right? That's going to represent about a 52% year-over-year revenue growth. It's still ideally richly valued. It's, it's still valued at a 15 forward price to sales. Now it's trading probably, it's probably not going to go too much lower because this 56% year-over-year growth is is a conservative number so i wouldn't be surprised to see them get a little bit closer into the 80 percent year over year um so when it when it was all the way up to 40 dollars, this this market cap didn't make sense and i remember i even saw that and i'm like yeah it's going to come back down just like fubo did because Mm -hmm. when a stock gets excited this is a great business model so when you're talking about the the skills business model i mean justin i don't don't think you could have done any better like said it any better it's an enablement platform it's not a game, and I think that's something that's a very popular misconception is that people think of game or skills as like the top three games that they have, but over the past five years, their top three games has turned over. So they're consistently they're, – they're a development and enablement platform that has grown exponentially over the past couple of years, and, and their, li- their latest quarterly reports was 91% year over year. Yeah. And they're guiding for 56% year over year, so they got a good idea. Right, and they're highly profitable business with 95% gross margins. So even during this entire downturn, I've been averaging down. I'm going to keep loading the boat because I, I think it's about to reverse here any day now. But it's still just got ahead of itself, and I think yeah. that a lot of people aren't 110% like because people just see a stock, they see 15 bucks or they see 14 bucks, but the market cap is actually what the price of the stock is, right? And then that that's where you can base your valuation metrics off of. And skills went all the way up to like a $12 billion market cap. And that $12 billion, I think, is actually even higher than that at, mm. at its very peak. Yep. $12 billion doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. Yeah, not not just yet. And nice. Appreciate that wrap up. I think you gave a lot of color to that. And just that, that, that one number just stands out so much to me. And it's what I use as the hook for the podcast that I did with Justin covering skills. If you haven't heard it, you can go check out the Market Madness podcast on Spotify, where they have 95% gross margins just crazy all right a uh, lot of skills going on there gannon i know that you're coming at us with a couple of different other areas within the nerd etf so floor is all yours yeah thank you thank you very much um great points by everyone um what's what's awesome about the esports and gaming industry is that it's you know it's an ecosystem you got media companies you have game developers you have hardware you have these offshoots like um discord twitch that all feed into this ecosystem um you know just a quick backdrop i was a very competitive in in sports in high school and middle school and one of the best outlets was gaming and you know kind of feed that competition um and what got me kind of enticed into buying into the esports industry was 
in college, I had a roommate. I spoke about this at the very beginning of the space. Um, who's a huge gamer, someone who, you know, games about probably eight hours a day on average, if not more. Um, it's kind of just his passion. Right. Um, and that's his technology, you know, top of the line, PC, laptop, uh, desktop, you name it, um, kind of opened my eyes to the hardware aspects, um, getting his ideas on, okay, no, no, this is this, the, the hardware that real gamers like. This is the hardware that they don't like. This, and when you're kind of on the outside, it, it can be very confusing. It can be a lot of information. You know, why is Corsair better than Logitech or yada, yada, yada? Um, so that's kind of just like the backdrop. Now, kind of getting into the theory of the esports industry as a whole, um, you know, you're seeing this massive growth. I'm just going to throw a stat at you guys that might blow your guys' minds. Um, League of Legends, which is one of the most competitive online games, it's a um, huge in South Korea and, and Southeastern um, Asian uh, countries, had in 2018 and 2019 100 million viewers. Um, and that's, that's just a huge statement right there just to show how big this is. In 2021, 96 million people watched the Super Bowl. Um, I know a lot of people in this space probably don't even know what League of Legends is. Um, it's a 5v5 game on the desktop, and it's very strategic. Uh, you have these champions that fight each other, um, but it's very team orientated. And what you've seen throughout the decades in esports is the team orientated games, the strategic games, um, tend to have a lot of power in the long run and and have lasting power like dota if you've ever heard of that even age of empires people are still playing that game and it's been around for decades um versus these you know uh single player games like fortnite and you know call of duty um so that's just like one quick stat but going into kind of esports as a whole um what really got me to start really honing in was when I noticed all these celebrities back in 2018, 2017, buying these esports uh, companies, just to name a few, you know, Michael Jordan invested $26 million in exotic, I'm going to butcher this name, Ixiomatic Gaming, which is the company that owns Team Liquid. Team Liquid is a huge company that um, it's actually a team for League of Legends that was back in 2018, Drake and Scooter Braun, co-owners of 100 Thieves. Younger people my age, 24, know what 100 Thieves is. Um, Steph Curry is a part owner of TSM, another League of Legends team. David Beckham, he invested in Guild Sports, Post Malone, invested in Dallas Empire, which is a Call of Duty team that won the Call of Duty League of 2020, Logic, Push a T. So you're seeing a lot of celebrities um, and a lot of athletes, professional athletes buying into these teams because they game. Uh, I mean, you see them all the time <laughs> running streams and such um, because it's a great outlet for people who are competitive. Now, it like I said before, someone who's kind of the outside, I would say about four to five years ago, I was kind of on the outside. I, I, I got a good grasp of what I, I love video games, but I didn't have a good grasp on what to invest in, you know? So I was kind of trying to find opportunities um, along the way. Luckily I followed Will Hershey, who is the CEO co-founder of round Hill. And they came out with this nerd ETF. And what I love about nerd ETF is, you know, it's an esports ETF and it offers exposure to investors in esports, digital entertainment, um, and it has pick, pick and shovel plays. It has hardware plays. It has um, media plays. So it, it kind of encapsulates the whole ecosystem that I was talking about, which, you know, for me, uh, with my risk tolerance, with my type of portfolio, I'd rather go that route than, than trying to find these individual players. 
Uh, we've seen, you know, companies like Epic Games, which is more kind of like, you know, the software developers, uh, de- uh, game developers have these issues with Apple where <laughs> overnight League of Legends is taken off the App Store. And, you know, that kind of scared me. Oh, oh, wait, you know, there's, there's, I would say, uh, a lot of companies above them that can, can really control what happens to their future. And so I kind of want to search out trying to get an ETF that would kind of take the whole ecosystem with it. So just going over, you know, nerd real quickly, um, has over a hundred million in assets under management, ticker symbol nerd has around 35 holdings. They, uh, rebalance every, I would say quarter. They have just off the top, their, their biggest holdings are, Razor, Tencent, Activision, Corsair, EA, Huya, Modern Times, NVIDIA, C Limited. Um, so those are kind of the, they do own skills. They own some other names that were mentioned earlier. Um, but you notice that kind of that diversity of, okay, wait, you got Corsair, Razor, which are the hardware components. You got C Limited, which are more game developers um, and Huya and such. So what's been great, I mean, COVID really fell into this ETF's lap, per se. Um, we all know whoever's my age probably picked up a, a controller during, during COVID. Um, it was a great way to connect with old friends. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever gained more in my life in the past you know, year because it was just like, how do I connect with friends that, that I can't see in person? Um, so why did I invest in esports? You know, 2.5 billion people play video games. That's almost two in three, um, including two in three Americans. There are 454 million esports viewers worldwide and growing to an estimate of 645 million by 2022. More people watch video games than Netflix, HBO, ESPN, and Hulu combined. I mean, that was a pretty wild stat that I saw. Um, the global gaming market is about 152 billion in 2019 and it's expected to estimate growth of 9% from 2018 to 2022. Um, you know, again, like I was saying, the esports and digital entertainment categories, it, it encapsulates publishers, media companies, streaming services and hardware developers, which I believe nerd captures perfectly. Esports viewership is expected to grow like I said earlier, 646 million by 2023, which is a 10.3% uh, CG, CAGR from 2018 to 2023. So we're seeing this massive growth. And, you know, I like to play video games. I, um, a natural growth for someone who wants to get more into video games is they start off with the consoles. And then they realize, oh, wait, I'm kind of being limited by these. And then they buy a desktop. And then before you know it, they have two monitors. And, and before you know it, <laughs> you know, you're, you're falling down the rabbit hole, right? Um, and that's really what happened to me um, as I've been building out my quote-unquote office space. And the funny thing is, the best hardware is gaming hardware. Um, people who want to have good running PC computers tend to buy gaming type products because those are the fastest running they're the most efficient um and so it really helps me because obviously my roommate um he was my roommate in college he's still my roommate now he knows even more about it than i do when it comes to actually what products are are working and the gaming community likes um because it really is there's a lot of social sentiment when it comes to esports when it comes to hardware specifically like Razer versus Logitech versus Corsair. Um, and he's kind of helped me through that progress of trying to pick it out. But at the end of the day, I was like, I just want to own this as a, as a whole. And we've seen, you know, Roundhill, Roundhill's um, nerd ETF just outperform practically every single video game esports ETF like Hero, uh, BGK, Espo, um, and, you know, so I think it's up 111% just this year versus 
glo- uh, SPO BGK, which are around 68 to 83 percent. Um, hopefully, you know, that was a good overview of why I think nerd can really continue to grow. They last thing I'll say is why did I choose nerd versus those other ones? Because obviously like um, it's easy to have 2020 vision and go, Oh yeah, well you like it. Cause it's up 111%. It wasn't up 111% when I bought it. Trust me. Um, when I looked at hero, they kind of had more of the picks and shovels plays. I liked how they had, they were more heavy on, SE Activision EA where nerd had kind of these offshoot like Razor, Corsair, these smaller companies um, that I can't know the fundamentals of all of them because there's 35 stocks. Obviously it's hard to you know track all of them, but following Will Hershey on Twitter and round Hill, I've, you know, when you're investing in an ETF, you're really investing in the ETF managers and, and their, their brains and their wits. Um, and I really liked following him and I really liked what he thought about the esports industry. And that's kind of why I went down that route. Absolutely. So again, the end, thank fit, you for my yeah. Ted talk. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a Ted talk, man. Legit right there. And I got to say that nerd, you know, I can relate to it as a special place in my heart. <laughs> so I first bought nerd on July 16th, 2019, 12 days after the IPO. Um, I was actually in a, fun- wow, nice. Yeah, I was in a finance class and my professor passed around a newspaper with a publishing of one of the first ever esports ETFs. Um, it was a, it was like a, I don't know, some basic like covering like, I don't know, like asset classes class. And we were covering ETFs that day and he goes, oh, this is something you might all be interested in. And he passes it around and I take out my phone in class and I just buy some shares. Because uh, I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that looks cool. So I've um, continued to add to my position um, I'm still up. You are correct. You know, it was up almost 150% at one point this year. But the author thing, which I was hoping to surprise you with, but didn't end up happening, was I DM'd a bunch with Will Hershey this weekend and tried to get him to come on this call because uh, I knew that you were going to be talking about nerd. Yeah. And I wanted him to, like, talk. But for anyone – so I've, I've had the, the pleasure of speaking with Will Hershey several times, as well as Tim Maloney, who is his co-founder of Roundtail. Um, I've been on Zoom calls with them. I've had Will in my spaces multiple times. Uh, Will knows his shit. Like – that guy makes me trust that he's making the right picks. Yeah. I mean, you ask him to start talking about the gaming industry, right. you better have a freaking half hour hour. Like, wow, can Will talk? So, so I, I, I completely agree, and I just love nerd. What, mm-hmm. it, one, one thing, last thing I'll, uh, I, I kind of forgot to say is I was fortunate in college to spend a good amount of time in South Korea and um, and Japan and other countries like that, and it's so a part of their culture gaming is it's like it's on it's it's a life it's like really a social lifestyle i mean if you guys ever get the chance i know people might tune into league of legends and be like what is going on but if you understand the game it is so entertaining and their world championships which was you know the the 100 million viewers um versus 2021 super bowl which is only 99 um it is a full blown event. We're talking like halftime show. They have like the biggest singers in the world. Um, like it, it, it is pretty incredible. So d- w- my main point is something that is odd and weird. And you're like, what is going on over there? What, what is this? Why are these, all these countries into this thing? I, I don't want to invest in it. I think that's something you should, you should gravitate to because It really is a lifestyle over there. They have video game bars, which are awesome. Basically, they have like the highest running internet speed and you go in, you grab beers, you, and there's tons of uh, desktops and you play video games. (laughs) It's honestly like a gamer's heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, So I am going to throw it over next to stock market news. Um, Just before I do that, I forgot to do this, but I always try to introduce myself on my calls. My name is Gov Blacksburg at Gov, G-A-V, Blacksburg, B-L-A-X-B-E-R-G. And I'm the COO and the voice of Wolf Financial on Twitter. And I guess all of our social medias as well. I was actually on Benzinga today, which was fun. Um, I hope you're enjoying this call. If you are enjoying this, uh, please make sure to check out my profile. If it's of interest to you, you can join the Wolf Pack, uh, where you get to hear from speakers like these and so many others every week. I already have all my Twitter spaces set up this week, this Friday, fantastic space. I'm going to have on Anthony Ohio and Avi Mash, 
the host of the Pounding the Table podcast, as well as uh, Pierce, who is the GM of Trading View, is going to be on that, um, and possibly some other people. I might have also, if anyone knows, uh, ha, uh, Luke Jacoby from Benzinga from their Power Hour. He's going to be on one of mine. So just make sure you know you're part of the Wolfpack. We're going to keep it coming. Um, I'm going to make a, another quick announcement about the Twitter spaces, but first, I know that it's uh, late. So stock market news, the floor is yours. Uh, he uh, doesn't have his AirPods on, so we're going to hope and pray that the sound quality is good. Yeah, no. So if it isn't, just cut me off. It's perfect. Me it's perfect. Whatever. Obviously, quality. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let me know if that changes. So uh, I didn't really have much prepared. I didn't know what I was, I was going to talk before. Um, but I really am a big gamer. I've been a gamer my entire life. I started out, I'm 22. I started out watching my sister play Nintendo 64 for a couple of years before I moved on to uh, GameCube and then Xbox. And then I, I've moved, I've switched over a little bit to uh, to PC, but I'm still a, uh, a console player at heart. I know some uh, some real gamers may call me a noob for that, but that's where I'm at. Uh, you know, I think the talk so far has been really great about the industry, gaming, and, and esports in general. I think that I'd I'd personally love to talk about some of the more you know obvious names, the the big players, and with a couple of the stuff that's been going on. I think that first thing uh, Caleb was talking about the uh, Oculus and Facebook earlier, and I just have to say, I recently got my Oculus delivered. I got it about last week or two weeks ago, and I've loved it. It's pretty awesome. You know, the stuff in there is incredible. Uh, I love playing multiplayer. The ping pong and boxing are awesome. So if you guys, I think you guys should check that out. I am biased. I am a, a Facebook shareholder, but I have gotten the console. And even if I wasn't, I still would be recommending it. So yeah, so there's that. It's super realistic. It's a hell of an arm workout. That's all I got to say with that. Uh, you know, moving on next, I think that Something that has interested me over the last couple of weeks as Roblox went public uh, was kind of the Roblox versus uh, Take-Two valuation. And, and Take-Two owns a, lot, a bunch of companies such as 2K, the whole 2K franchise, GTA, Red Dead Redemption. And I've, I've really been curious of how Take-Two has gotten zero credit for GTA kind of making the switch into allowing creators uh, make their own servers, such as Roblox and Minecraft, have really excelled in. Uh, if you guys don't know Ro what Roblox and Minecraft really do, is they kind of have their main games, but they also allow creators, developers, to go crazy and build their own servers and build everything and build mini games. So more or less, you're playing Roblox, but you're spending hours doing hundreds of different things, whilst Battle Royale, Paintball, whatever. There's so much stuff you can do on there. And GTA has begun to make that switch, and the company has gotten absolutely zero credit for it. So that's something that has really intrigued me and in how Take-Two is at 50% of the valuation of Roblox. Uh, that's something that has really kind of, you know, rattled my brain. And if after I'm speaking, any of the speakers have or, uh, uh, yeah, have any thoughts on that, feel free to jump in on that. And then finally, uh, one thing that's kind of been popping off starting yesterday and more into today was the, uh, the formation of the Super League. Uh, with soccer, football, whatever, wherever you guys are from. And one thing that I kind of haven't seen anyone really talk about it, but that's really interesting to me, is that FIFA uh, has had a – FIFA and EA Sports has, has for a long time had a really stranglehold, more or less, on the competitions. They get the exclusive rights to a lot of these competitions, the teams. They had the exclusive rights to the Champions League. So a game like Pez was not able to include it. And with the formation of the Super League, the uh, all their contracts and everything of that is really up in the air. So I feel like that could be a huge stepping stone, which could you know signal possibly the end of FIFA's dominance in the uh, in the soccer, football, video game space. So that's something I'm looking out for. Uh, and yeah. Hopefully Wolf's uh, mic didn't cut off. Yeah, uh, he just DM'd me that his space is crashed on him. Um, oh. Epic. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he got thrown out. Hopefully it doesn't end. I don't know. He's a host right now. It just moved spots. Um, what about like some Q&A? Anyone want to? Incredible platform. A hundred percent. I love sitting like whenever I'm playing video games, I have a Twitch streamer on in the background. Uh, yeah, so I I'm watching so much, definitely watching more than Netflix. There's a competition there between YouTube, but 
Still definitely allowed Twitch. Absolutely. Uh, so one thing that I do actually... Oh, sorry. One sec. Uh, one thing that I do want to do real quickly, which I really wanted to share when we had 100 people on here, but unfortunately, uh, now we have a lot less people. Um, I am going to real quick just make a post. So uh, to anybody that's on here, I've been getting a lot of feedback from people that it's very hard to know when spaces are going to be, when they're going to be happening. Um, people are just often unsure. So what I am sharing real quick is a post. And what I've created is a public Google Calendar. So I'm really hoping this doesn't crash the space. But I'm going to try and take that. And my goal would be to pin it in here. But maybe you could go check out my profile. And what this will allow you all to do, to anyone who's interested in the spaces, and I would love if my speakers um, would join this. It doesn't share your information with anybody. Um, here, wait. I think I can pin it. Can I pin it into the space? I don't even know how to share things into the... Uh... Oh, here we go. Share into the space. Let's see if it actually works. I don't know if it's... Oh, there we go. Okay. You can see it up top. Basically, if you love spaces, uh, I made a public Google Calendar. I'm going to put all my spaces on here, um, you know, as far out as I can plan them. Sometimes I have to spend the whole weekend basically planning these things. It doesn't just, like, happen right off the bat. Um, but if you join that, you will get the info. I'll try to put the speakers in the descriptions. And then I'll even try and, like, drop the spaces link if I can into them. Um, once they update. But I think this is, is my best system for right now for keeping people in the loop on when the Twitter spaces are happening. So one question that I got that I want to throw it back to was, um, C Caleb, you probably saw this question. Somebody tweeted at us the, what do you call it? The, um, the ENGMF news. Do you want to talk about that, about them being added? Oh, yeah, that was in my notes. This is Caleb. So I, I talked a little bit about uh, ticker ENGMF, Enthusiast Gaming. Uh, they actually... Uh, th they applied for the NASDAQ listing on April 15th. Uh, I, I don't have any idea how long those take. I'm, I, we could probably look it up and figure it out. Uh, but that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge, huge win. Currently, uh, that that stock that is pretty thinly traded. Um, so if this can, you know, what, it's going to happen. Uh, I, I don't know much about the regulatory behind that because I know that uh, Acuity Ads, ticker ACUIF, they're also been trying to get to that as well. Um, see here, I had I closed off some screens. Let me pull this back up. Um, well, well, either way, um, if you are looking into this company right now, I had talked about. Uh, I I do all my work through Charles Schwab, and they don't charge any fees for trading over the counter. It's a Canadian listed company. I think it's uh, I think it's on OTX. Uh, right now, those trades have an average trading volume of about 300,000 shares a day. Um, generally, when you list on NASDAQ, you know, there's a lot more people who have access to it. It's more readily tradable. Right now, the bid-ask spread can be kind of wide. So I may think I'm trying to get shares at $8, and it might go through at eight ten or eight fifteen. you know, whatever, 5 10 15 cents. If you're trading hundreds or thousands of shares, that's a huge difference. Um, so this is a really big deal. It when this gets pulled into the the NASDAQ, um, nothing would change. You'd still have all your shares. Not, I mean, it'd just be a one, it's just basically a conversion. Um, but yeah, that, that's a huge win. Um, I, I don't really have any specifics on it. I, I can't really find a whole lot in a, of particulars on that. Um, but as that progresses, we would know more. And that just means, you know, there's more buyers that's how price action works. You have buyers and sellers, demand and supply. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying go out and buy shares because it's going to be listed. But if you had listened to me talk about enthusiast gaming, you know it's a it's a it's a massive hyper growth story right now. Um, so that I just I forgot to touch on that. And um, one of the listeners here had a shot a note to us, uh, the degenerate socialite. So thank you for sending that note. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you. That was nice insight on ENGMF. Um, to my to my speakers, uh, to anyone in my audience, I just made that post. It's linked in the space right now. If anyone could retweet it, just you know, I, I know it's uh it's a lot, but just like to my speakers, to everyone, if you could just hit the retweet on that, I would love to get more people on that calendar. Again, it does not share information. I can't even see anybody who signed up for the calendar. It's really max three to four events a week um, that are going to be on there. 
uh, not bothering people, just trying to get the information out. So like your audiences will just have the ability. Plus, you know, a bunch of you are on the spaces anyways. So it'd be a great opportunity um, to just bring more of your audiences into this. So thank you so much, you know, Gannon, Caleb, um, Justin, Twitter investors, uh, Dylan, everyone who's um, been sharing that. That's really, really, really helpful um, because I, I want to bring this community together somehow. And Twitter doesn't really seem to want to give us more features for spaces. So damn it, I'm going to do it myself. Uh, that's, I, I can't fix the bugs, but I can make a, uh, I can make a calendar. That's, that's what I've got. Um, all right. Twitter investors, the first space wasn't working for you. I know you wanted to talk, um, real quick. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna give you the floor here. Let's see if we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Oh, we got you. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I don't know what was going on with the last one, but, um, for some reason, I mean, I couldn't even, I mean, I would join and then I couldn't hear anyone. I don't know. It was just really weird. But um, hopefully they kind of continue to fix it over time. And then hopefully I can finally get access to actually using them as well. Um, no, I think I, we're obviously talking about gaming. Uh, I think it's interesting what's going on right now. I'm not I'm not actually exposed to any gaming companies right now, but I have held Alphabet for a little while. Um, and I think they are a little bit exposed. I think I think, though, their Stadia kind of foray um, – as of right now, it could be seen as kind of a flop. I mean, I personally don't know too many people uh, that actually have used Stadia, tried Stadia, or are still using Stadia. Um, I think that that's where I think the, the majority of the technology is going. Um, we've seen the crossover with uh, CDs from movies and TV shows to Netflix. Um, I think, obviously, a game just fully online is obviously a lot bigger bigger than just uh one video or one show but i think that's where the majority of, of stuff is going and i think the people that are able to capture that i think like nvidia you have stadia you have i think a few other competitors that are trying to bring kind of cloud gaming to the to the front um that's where i think a lot of it's going to be uh i think also you have obviously other platforms that are working on their own just kind of stream uh streaming games so that's what I'm looking for. And then also, I think also the changing kind of business models in a lot of these bigger games uh, with these AAA studios. Uh, we saw kind of the biggest move when Fortnite came and uh, their model is entirely free with microtransactions. Uh, we've obviously seen how that went. And uh, it was kind of interesting. During that time, I think it was 2017, 2018, I, t I actually ended up talking to the head analyst on the Asia desk at Barclays for that handled uh, a couple of the different companies there, Tencent specifically, which I think at that time owned a little over 50% of Epic Games, obviously Riot Games. And um, at that point, it wasn't clear uh, if Fortnite was going to do super well or it was still kind of a side feature of, of the game. And obviously, we've seen how that's turned out. So I think it's just interesting. The One, we have the streaming of games, which will come into the center stage over time uh, across all the different spectrums. And then number two, also the uh, platforms or the changing business models that these kind of gaming studios will have to go for when it, when it comes to starting out free and microtransactions or sticking to some kind of $60 reduced price for streaming games or downloadable games instead of a CD. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that's a very strong point there. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, one more time uh, to everybody. I, I, I hate to promote this, but I'd love to get this out there. I want more people on this calendar. To any of my listeners, there's 70 on here. Um, almost a thousand people have seen this calendar tweet in nine minutes. Uh, let's, let's get that to like 5,000. Let's, um, let's pump this thing up. Any retweets are really like just um, I don't ever ask for retweets on posts ever. I've never asked them before. But if anybody can share this, I think this would be such a big help to the community. Um, we can organize these spaces a little bit better. Uh, Twitter, you know, they're, they're tough. They're not very responsive to me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do my best. But uh, hey, you know, we're, we're going to do our best from our end. So uh, last um, words, I'm just going to give kind of a, a couple minutes. Nice, Gannon. Uh, I'm going to give it just a couple, like one to two minutes just to wrap up. I'm um, teaching my speakers. Uh, and then I, I didn't see too many other questions from the crowd. I saw a question about pen, I guess, you know what, let's do this, do this question on pen real quick. Um, because I really like pen and pens dropping hard. So Gannon, we talked about pen last week, so I'm going to throw it over to you thoughts on pen dropping to, let me see, $92 and 94 cents a share. 
Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't own pen. I own pen through bets, which actually I was kind of, I forgot to bring up bets is another ETF. Um, that is by Ron Hill. That is kind of, it's obviously not e-sports. It's more like e-betting. Um, but I think it was mentioned before, I believe by Caleb or Justin that, you know, the, the whole market was, was very overheated. We're, we're talking about a stock that went from $4 to 140. Um, so, you know, I, I can't list it off the top of my head, but the, it, with like skills, you know, the market cap kind of just got astronomical there. And I think it's coming back down to earth a little bit. Um, I'm not sure where the support is. Is it in free fall? Um, again, I think that Penn has a huge future. I was going to ask, I, I don't know who covered, might have been Dylan. Um, someone said that they like DraftKings over Penn. Um, maybe I, I'm going to kind of throw this back at the, uh, the person who talked about DraftKings a lot. What, why do you like Penn or sorry, DraftKings over Penn? That was me. So it really has to do with like the clear market leadership and it's a pure play, right? So you got DraftKings <clears throat> that is, that's actually going to be that mobile application online, iCasino, uh, on sports betting, but Penn, you have, how do I say this? It's a little bit more watered down by their, their, just their normal casino operations. Now, if I had a, if I would absolutely prefer to be, have a stake in just bar stool sports, if there was a case to just do that, but you can't, right? So you have a whole other, you know, part of the operations where you're not going to necessarily have that, that access to that online gaming. It's, it's, it's a jumble of all of Penn national. So, I mean, that's, that's really the biggest reason why it's like, Hey, if you're really bullish on the, uh, the mobile eye gaming industry, then why not have, you know, the best peer player? They're a clear market leader. Um, and it could potentially have more upside in the long run. I, um, you know, I guess my one retort is that, you know, I, I think DraftKings as well has, you know, huge potential. I mean, that's why I do own bets. So I, I own both. Um, I think the one advantage one of the advantages that Penn has is just the, like unlimited advertising um, with all their social celebrities slash um, employees, you know, at any moment in time, Dave Portnoy can basically send out a tweet. Hey, everyone start selling this shirt or something. Um, and then all of his employees who all have tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of followers um, can get on the bandwagon. But I totally agree that, you know, when when you're really into an industry, it's always best to just identify the the, the leaders. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would help in my case and probably anyone's case that whenever you invest in things like, you know, let, let's say it's Epic Games or DraftKings, you know, do your dil due diligence. And the way one of the best ways to do that, download the app and use it. You know, uh, I try to download that Barstool Sports app. And I'm not in the state that you can use it. Um, that's one of the, the bigger issues right now. They're, they're all trying to get into every state. Um, but if I were to invest in DraftKings, I, uh, you know, pure play outright own shares versus owning the ETF. Um, that's definitely something I would do. I know about what DraftKings does, but I've never used the app. And I think that's critical before you, you make that leap. Yep. Yeah, and I'd like to actually build on top of that with just a little bit of data too. So when you when you actually take a look at the data and, and the market leadership in some of these big eye casino or eye gaming industries, so like the Mich Michigan's data, for example, you had, uh, it seems like the big three, but DraftKings is always going to be number one. It's always going to be like, number one is going to be DraftKings. Number two is a switch between FanDuel and, uh, what is it, Barstool Sports, right? But DraftKings, in every single market that they're in, they're always the number one player. And then you have, like, Rustry Interactive, right? They're the lagger just trying to pull up the, you know, they're kind of <laughs> picking up the scraps wherever they possibly can. Um, but, you know, Rustry Interactive, that's going to be a lot more of the iCasino, right? So that's going to be the iGaming. Uh, so they're, they're a much, much – they're the number one player in terms of – if so if you're bullish on the idea of, like, an online casino – 
Rush Street Interactive is the market leader there. In terms of online sports betting, DraftKings is the number one. And if you actually take a look and, and extrapolate both of them, you from like just the overall like numbers that they're pulling right now, um, from just the online like application based casino market that's a combination between the casino like the iGaming portion and sports betting that you got like DraftKings and Rush Street Interactive that are neck and neck and I, I actually made a YouTube video so if any of you guys want to check that out um, I got a YouTube link in my in my profile and you can find Rush Street Interactive it's one of my most watched videos but it breaks it down about how the sports betting industry actually looks and how they all play in how, how they all play in together so well, uh, DraftKings, it's, it's just, it's a no-brainer. Awesome. I, I brought up Tim because he has a question. Before I go to Tim, one other thing I want to say real quick, just because I have um, people on here, is the next Twitter space. It's actually going to be a morning Twitter space. So I'm doing it during lunchtime to hopefully get people on there. That's going to be on Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday in two days at 11.30 a.m. EST. It's already on the calendar. So if you have a calendar, uh, you'll see it. That's going to be a one-on-one -on -one Twitter space with Jonah Lupton asking him questions from our followers. Um, I just tweeted out a tweet about it, and I'm going to pin it. And the reason I'm going to pin it is because we're actually taking questions from all of you. Um, so essentially, if you have a question about a company that you think, um, you know, maybe maybe Jonah is interested in or something along those lines. Speaker, over to you. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Wolf. Uh, I think Gannon, you know, was hinting at this, but Dylan, I would love your perspective on, you know, I'm, I'm in uh, DraftKings right now and not Penn, but I do love Penn as a company and just love, you know, the barstool aspect. Can you talk a little bit about the customer acquisition cost on DraftKings versus Penn, uh, given Penn's, you know, omni-channel strategy? I'm not familiar with that, that metric. So I get just how much they have to spend. And in, in, in marketing and advertising to be able to acquire, you know, a customer onto DraftKings. Yeah, uh, that's platform. actually a really good question. So when you take a look at their expenditure, so you can take So when you look at their income statement, right, um, you see that they're they're ramping up. I mean, they're they're obviously not net income like they're net income negative. And you see that a majority of their expenses are coming from marketing sales and marketing efforts. But this is this has a lot to do with the fact that the sports betting industry is growing at a, a compound annual growth rate of 10 percent year over year. And especially it's going to be um, it's going to go up. It's going to go up faster, uh, yeah, more than 10 percent if legalization really starts to become mainstream throughout the entire United States. So when they when you think about like their marketing spend, like their SGA and expense, you have to think like, are they capable of doing it in the first place? Right? It's, can they actually spend? Can they keep that expenditure going? And what are they trying to accomplish? And it's really just gaining and, and maintaining. Did we lose him? Can anybody hear anybody? I'm I'm here. I can, I can hear you, Caleb. I can. Hear I can you. I, I, we lost Dylan. I think. Damn it! He was just spitting fire. <laughs> oh, uh, another one bites the dust. Real quick, yeah. real quick before he comes I, back. I, I think. Yeah. Let's give a round of applause to Twitter Spaces. <laughs> Did we just lose Wolf too mid sentence? <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> I can see why Clubhouse has got that uh, four billion valuation. No, oh, but no. dude, so many competitors. Even Facebook's launching today. I saw Reddit's coming with a co yeah. competitor. Wow. I'm gonna be I sad to see you guys leave Twitter sure. and go somewhere so, else. <laughs> yeah, that that cut me off mid sentence. Where where was I at? You were discussing just uh, the SGNA and and how you know the Caggers, you know, ten percent, uh, I believe, every year. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah. Can the free cash flow cover the expense? The SGNA you're talking about, ten percent. Well, you gotta you gotta think about it like, right? It's all about the story. So you can't just look at one metric and then determine whether or not an investment is going to be better than the other one. Like I like I mentioned, they they are market leaders in every single market that they're in right now, and with one point eight billion dollars in cash and virtually no debt on their balance sheet, they can afford to have that 
excessive marketing expense, especially as they come into scaling. That's what is so important about this marketing expense is if they're, if they are spending so much right now, uh, trying to get that market share, you can't help but believe that over time they will scale up to a point when the, the free cash,